a KQED HD production. It's a frozen desert, bone dry and covered in dust. And if you were to visit, your first breath of its thin air, mainly carbon dioxide, would likely be your last. Despite its hostile landscape, the possibility of life on Mars has long stirred the popular imagination. From H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds to Tim Burton's Mars Attacks, The idea of life on Mars has also stirred the scientific imagination. We hope for more good data in 1967. And now a new Mars mission hopes to provide answers to the most fundamental questions about life on Earth. Are we alone? Is life common? Is there a second genesis? Christopher McKay from NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California, has spent more than 30 years looking for life on other worlds. Mars is really interesting for the search for life because it's a world which we know at one time had an Earth-like period. It had water, it had rivers, lakes, maybe even an ocean, and therefore we think it must have had a thick atmosphere. The question I'm interested in is, did the other world have life too? That's the $2.3 billion question behind NASA's Mars Science Laboratory, or MSL, scheduled to launch in late 2011 and land on the Red Planet in August of 2012. The project is the most advanced probe ever sent to land on Mars. Its new high-tech rover called Curiosity will search for evidence that the Martian environment was once capable of supporting life. We know that rocks have come from Mars and landed on Earth. We assume that the reverse is also possible, and we know that these rocks could carry life. But I think a deeper and more important question is the possibility that there was life on Mars, and it represents a separate origin of life, a second genesis, different life from Earth. That would tell us that right here in our solar system, life started on Earth and independently on Mars. We'd have two, two examples of life, and that would tell us without doubt that life is common in the universe. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun and our closest planetary neighbor. Named after the Roman god of war, Mars is commonly referred to as the red planet because the iron oxide on its surface gives off a reddish glow in the night sky. Since the 1960s, dozens of increasingly sophisticated robotic spacecraft, including orbiters, landers, and rovers, have been launched from Earth toward Mars. The very first missions to Mars just whizzed by, took a few pictures, and kept going. Unfortunately, they took pictures of the part of Mars that looks like the moon. Then orbiters came, and we saw the part of Mars that looked like the Earth. We realized that Mars, in a sense, was half like the moon, half like the Earth. Our interest went way up. That was green for touchdown. The next mission was the Viking. That was a very sophisticated laboratory standing in a stationary spot on Mars doing analysis. Then the follow-up missions on the surface were development of rovers. The twin rovers Spirit and Opportunity landed on the surface of Mars in 2004. Natalie Cabrol of the SETI Institute in Mountain View was on the team that decided where to send them. We went from Mars frozen in time, cold on the lava plain, to earlier Mars on the Columbia Hills, a time where climate was warmer and the geological activity was a lot more diverse. And all of a sudden, we discovered uh, evidence of water, evidence for volcanic activity, interacting with water, explosive activity. And now comes Curiosity, designed to do much more than all of the preceding Mars missions. And that is what I think makes it so exciting. The prospect that we can take this sophisticated laboratory and now move it around, take it wherever we want to go.
The new rover, about the size of a small car, will be more than five times as heavy and will carry more than 10 times the weight of scientific instruments as its predecessors. Curiosity will scout out promising sites, gather samples, and subject them to sophisticated mineral and organic analysis. The instrument's payload on Curiosity is just amazing. You will have microscopes and you will have lasers to zap the dust from the surface so that you can look really at the composition of what you're looking at. You will be able to see mineralogy, composition, chemistry. To me, Curiosity it's, is this amazing Swiss Army knife rover of the Mars exploration, you know. One of the tools in that Swiss Army knife that's already been loaded into Curiosity at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena is called the Kemen. It was invented by astrogeologist David Blake from NASA Ames. We're in the right place, I think. Yep. You can kind of imagine this whole place with no vegetation on it. Blake and his colleague, Tori Holler, test a terrestrial prototype of the Kemen at Jasper Ridge in the eastern foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains. So we're going to do the processing of these rocks, just like Curiosity would do it on Mars. But of course, we don't have the real fancy hardware that's on Curiosity. We basically have hammers and, and sieves and things like that. Kamen will be able to identify the minerals and samples of powdered rock or soil that the rover's robotic arm will deliver to a funnel. It uses X-ray diffraction to analyze the minerals in the Martian soil by directing an X-ray beam at a sample and recording how it's scattered by the sample's atoms. Just put a little bit inside of that hole. I can see within 10 seconds that this is a serpentine rock. It will take up to 10 hours for the Kemen to do on Mars what Blake's prototype did in just a few minutes at Jasper Ridge. The data from the analysis of each sample will go to the rover's computer, then to an orbiting satellite, and then back to Earth, where Blake and his team will be waiting for the results. If we find rocks that are similar to what we saw in the field today, we would be able to say that there was water present there, that energy was present, created by those rocks, that could be used by a microbe for life. Curiosity will look for signs that microbial life once existed, but it will not be able to distinguish between something that was once alive billions of years ago and a living microorganism. My secret agenda is that the results of MSL are so intriguing, so fascinating, and so much like a fingerprint of something that could be alive that we can't wait to go back and do a direct test for life. Could life exist today on the Red Planet? Cabral looks for an answer to that question in some of the most extreme and inhospitable environments on Earth, where the air is thin, ultraviolet rays are strong, and temperatures are frigid. Earthly conditions as close as possible to those on Mars, where highs go up to about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, and lows are 200 degrees below zero. I have yet to find a place where I did not find life on Earth. In one of these most impossible places, you still find things. That tells you something, that sends you a message. Wherever life can be, it's going to be. A manned mission to Mars in the mid-2030s is on the drawing boards. I think there will certainly be human exploration of Mars. We'll go to the moon, we'll set up a base there, and then we'll go to Mars. The question is really just when, and will I be around to see it? Uh, so I want the answer to that to be yes, and so I go running every day, and I don't smoke, and I try to eat right, so that maybe when I'm 150 years old, humans will go to Mars. Given all the problems we face on Earth, is the search for life on Mars worth all of the effort and expense? It's just like asking Christopher Columbus which most of the European kings and queens did at the time, what worse there is to go and explore. At some point, you have to take a leap of faith. And then from the encounter, something completely new can happen. But if you don't do that, if you don't take that leap, you will never know. <laughs>